Hello, friends. It's time for the second hour of Open Line with Dr. Michael Radelnik, Moody Radio's Bible study across America. It's where we talk about your questions on a regular basis about the Bible, God, and the spiritual life. But not today. No questions today. It's the questions you've formulated for months and years about Israel, the Jewish people, uh, questions about prophecy. We're talking about those issues today with my special guests. I'm Michael Rydelnik. I'm professor of Jewish studies and Bible at Moody Bible Institute, as well as academic dean there. Joining me today is Eva Rydelnik, who has served for many years with Chosen People Ministries, but also uh, has been for many years a professor at Moody Bible Institute. And uh, she is here with me today. Also, Levi Hazen, executive director of Life of Messiah. And uh, Levi, I, I have to mention that you're a Moody grad. I appreciate that so much since we are all Moody connected here. And then, of course, a friend of mine who is not officially Moody connected, but a longtime friend of Moody Bible Institute is Mitch Glazer, president of Chosen People Ministries, Dr. Uh, Glazer. Good to be here. But Michael, may I remind you that I am a Moody author. That's right. That's Moody, right. You're part of the Moody family, Moody Publishers I, author. Exactly. All those uh, the big, fall feasts all, of Israel. All, Mm-hmm. Those big royalty checks every year always <laughs> remind me of my loyalty to Moody. <laughs> and wait, let me ask you this. This is a very cool thing. You once said to me the what a significant number of, of staff with Chosen People Ministries went to Moody and oh my gosh. studied in Jewish studies. I would say, well, remember, we're just a little older than Moody, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so... Uh, Actually, you're not. Moody, 1886. Oh, really? Yeah, 1886. That's our year. I'm sorry. I will respect my elders better. There you go. Uh, but very so, close. but but since the founding of chosen, <laughs> very close. Since the founding of chosen people, I mean, it's easily two, three hundred, maybe more. Yeah. Who have yeah. served with I, chosen? People. I wasn't there for some of the ones earlier, but for the last thirty years, uh, you know, when we had the hundredth anniversary of Jewish studies at Moody, that was and fun. and all these people came together to celebrate uh, at the missions conference that year. I was amazed that I, I'd forgotten how many students, and they, it was of course it wasn't all of them, but how many students had come through in the last thirty years and were now serving. In ministry, thank you, Mitch, for bringing them. And Levi, you were here; you were a speaker at the conference. That was just uh, terrific. Uh, appreciate that. And of course, you brought your wife, Stephanie. Certainly, a better half, uh, just like me, for so, sure. Yeah. We married up for sure. Yeah, for sure. So, anyway, let's. I want to continue our conversation about Israel, and particularly, you know, there are a lot of people who uh, want to say that that the uh, the promises that God made have, to Israel are still in existence, but they've been given to a new Israel, the Israel of God. And the verse they cite is Galatians 6.16, which uh, says this, and I, I, I think it's important that we address this verse. Okay, here it is. I'm reading it to you now as you hear the pages turning. It says, at the end of the book of Galatians, uh, my pe- may peace come to all those who follow this standard and mercy to the Israel of God. And they say the Israel of God, obviously Paul is is blessing the followers of Jesus, and so the Israel of God must be the church. Uh, and, and that's the basis for saying that the Israel of God is, is now the church. So how how I'm going to throw this out. I know how I would answer it. Wondering how how you would answer that. I think uh, yeah. uh, I'll just jump in for a quick start. I think that it is more of a reflection of the the remnant of Israel. There's mm-hmm. always been a remnant of Israel. When I was a kid and heard the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal, I thought that the prophets of Baal were the pagan nations around, and Elijah was standing up for the God of Israel. Only when I got older and looked at the passage really in detail did I realize, oh, no, all those prophets of Baal were Jewish people. They were the people they of were, Israel, They right? were the people of Israel. Yeah, they were the people of Israel who were not following the God of Israel, but were following pagan and so deity. The, 
They, and, the remnant were the true faithful to the God of the, Israel. Yes, exactly. And we see that throughout the Old Testament. Uh, you know, I mean, think about, you know, when Elijah was so discouraged and he said, I'm the only one left. And God says, oh, no, well, there's still a remnant. And I think that's what we see here in play within the New Testament. It talked about it in Romans. There's at the present time a remnant who are going to follow me. And I think that's the Israel of God that we see here yeah. in Galatians. So, uh, because Israel... In the New Testament, always means Israel. Yeah. 73 times the word Israel is used in the New Testament. This would be the only time when it's not referring to ethnic Jewish people. That that doesn't seem to make sense. Yeah, I think what we want to do is we want to interpret the unclear in light of the clear. Mm-hmm. And because we have 72 other times where Israel either refers to the people or the land or the people mm-hmm. at large yeah. uh, of the Jewish people— why would this time be the one case that it doesn't mean that? Yeah, and and also it makes sense that uh, Paul would bless Jewish believers at this point, don't you think? Uh, it says uh, that that peace and mercy, you know, the uh, the blessing and upon the Israel of God is literally how it is. Uh, you could just see that there are in Galatians there were people, Jewish people, who had apparently come to faith in Jesus, some sort of faith, but they were adding circumcision as a requirement for Gentiles. And Paul says, no, only faith in Jesus. And there were also Jewish believers who agreed with Paul, another Jewish believer, that it was only by faith in Jesus. And so at the end of this very firm rebuke of this false teaching, Paul gives a special blessing to all who follow his teaching, and especially in a sense upon the Israel of God, the faithful Jewish believers who had not gone off on this wrong teaching. And so it seems to me that this is the one verse that would affirm what Paul says in Romans 11, that there's an Israel of God. So a Jewish people. Another verse that sometimes uh, is confused uh, is Romans chapter uh, 2, verse 28. Mm -hmm. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, 29, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter, and his praise is not from men, but from God. Clearly, that is a, a passage written to Jewish believers in Jesus. Or about Jewish believers mm-hmm. in Jesus. Or about, yeah. right, about yeah. Jewish believers in Jesus. And yeah. uh, and so, clearly, uh, there is that distinction. Uh, we're all one in, in Messiah. But we do have men, we do have women, we do have Jews, we do have Gentiles. And when a Jewish person is born again by the Spirit of God, and they love the Lord Jesus as their Savior and Messiah, then they become part of the Israel of God. Mm -hmm. That's what's used in Romans chapter 9. I believe so. Uh, Paul's consistent. Yeah, uh, that's what he says in Romans 9. Uh, There he's talking about, you know, we've talked all about this... uh, the benefits he talks about for Israel in verses 4 and 5. And then in verse 6, he says, It's not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel, or the real true Israel. Uh, Neither are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants. There it's talking about that there's a special Israel, the Jewish believers, the Israel within Israel. And by the way, most, even people who hold to a replacement view, agree with my understanding of Romans 9, 6, and 7, that uh, the Jewish believers are the down payment for what's going to happen in Romans 11 when all Israel will believe at one point in the future. Uh, But that's the key, that there's... It's sort of like when I talk about a real Moody student versus other Moody students. When I'm talking about a real Moody student, you know, he goes to all the games, uh, watches all the, the... the, the goes to all the activities, does everything other than just coming to class. And well, no, they're all Moody students, but there's a real Moody student, the remnant of Moody students. That's what we're talking about there. Yeah, I think that's so, one of the most helpful illustrations is like a true fan. Yeah. And what Paul's doing here is he's he's narrowing, not widening. Yeah. So he's saying there's a special remnant within Israel that's called the true Israel. He's not saying Gentiles are somehow. Mm-hmm now included in Israel. Yeah, yeah. And so I think, yes. I was going to say, interesting too, with this circumcising, a circumcised heart, this isn't a New Testament concept. It's rooted in the prophets. 
Like in, I was thinking about Jeremiah 4, 4, which says, circumcise yourselves to the Lord and remove the foreskins of your heart. It's yeah. scattered throughout the prophets, this idea yeah. of uh, faithfulness being internal, not just an external sign. And even then in Jeremiah's day, there was those who had the faithful heart. They were the true Israel of God, uh, the faithful remnant of Israel. So, yeah, I think that this is crucial that we understand these passages because some people want to take these verses and misunderstand them. We're going to talk about uh, what God will do in terms of reaching Jewish people in in just a moment. Uh, but for now, I, I'm really grateful that we looked at some of these verses because God is really faithful and he has kind of picked Jewish believers, not because Mitch and I and Eva, uh, not because we're special, but because God is faithful and that's proof that he'll be faithful to all people. Uh, that's the, the remnant. We're going to come back and talk about that more in just a moment. Stay with us. It's Open Line. This is Michael Radelnik. My mom survived the Ludge Ghetto and the Gross Rosen concentration camp. She worked as a nurse in the Ludge Ghetto Infirmary. That infirmary was housed in the Chosen People Ministries Outreach Center building that existed before the Holocaust. Even in that dark time, the light of the good news was being proclaimed. Now, Chosen People Ministries is offering a book to remind us of God's activity during the Holocaust. Never again, The Holocaust Remembered is a collection of stories from the Chosen People Ministries archives detailing the courage, bravery, and grace found in the midst of the unspeakable tragedy of the Holocaust. If you'd like a free copy of Never Again, all you have to do is go to our website, openlineradio.org, scroll down, you'll see a link that says a free gift from Chosen People Ministries. Click on that, you'll be taken to a page where you can sign up for your own free copy of Never Again, The Holocaust Remembered. And we're back. I'm so glad you're listening. Thank you for listening to Open Line. I'm Michael Rydelnik. With me today, Eva Rydelnik, Levi Hazen of Life in Messiah, and Dr. Mitch Glazer of Chosen People Ministries. Uh, it's great to be talking about these important subjects, not only because we agree, but we're friends. Yeah. And <laughs> it's nice to be together. I have a great time together. But uh, here's the thing. Eva, you wanted to mention something about the New Covenant before as we talked about this idea of of the church replacing Israel and showing how God no church God has special and great promises for Israel but not a replacement yeah and not I mean for the it, church but right. not a replacement not of Israel. replacing Israel I think it's uh, but because there's this divider in our Bible between the Old Testament and the New Testament and some people kind of make the mistake of thinking well the Old Testament's for the Jews and the New Testament's for the Christians. And there's confusion even about the new covenant. But it's very clear that this new covenant that we uh, talked about a little bit ago from Jeremiah 31, who is it made to? The new covenant is not made with the church because Jeremiah 31, 31, one of the easiest references to remember, says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah not like the covenant that I made when I brought them out of Egypt. So there's that distinction between the new covenant and the Sinai covenant. I think that Levi mentioned before, the Sinai covenant was conditional, the new covenant unconditional. Hmm. And you think, well, when did, when did this happen? When did, he, when did this take place? And it took place at the time when the, when the Lord Jesus established what we call the Lord's Supper. And it was his last Passover. And it says in Luke chapter 22, a verse that sometimes people just kind of skip over, that he talks about that he that this is the new covenant in my blood, that that's when the new covenant was established. And well, then how is it related to the church? And I think that goes back to that uh, conversation that we had a few minutes ago about the olive tree, mm-hmm. that the church, people who believe in Jesus from non-Jewish backgrounds are grafted in to that new covenant. So the the church is made of Jewish people who believe in Jesus, that remnant, and Gentiles who believe in Jesus. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about this. This is so important. If God has chosen Israel and he is faithful to his promises, the question I get all the time is, well, are you saying uh, that, that Jewish people automatically are saved by virtue of being Jewish? And so what I'd like to address here is if the Jewish people are still, in a sense, 
what we're talking about here, the people of God, what sort of relationship do does a Jewish person need to have with Yeshua in order to experience forgiveness and personal peace and, and an eternal for, forever forgiven relationship with God? Are we, are we saying that that's not, does a Jewish person not need Yeshua? Does Yeshua save them without them knowing it? What's going on here in Scripture? Well, I think uh, hopefully with our audience, it goes without saying that John fourteen six is true for Jews as it was for Gentiles, exactly. since it was really originally spoken to Jews. Mm-hmm. And that was that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father, no Jew, no Gentile, no man, no woman. But nobody comes to the Father but through him. And so, you know, are we being hard-nosed and uh, arrogant by saying that there's only one way of salvation. Well, the best way to do the, to figure this out, although it's a little difficult, is to ask somebody who, uh, maybe a high priest who may have entered uh, the Holy of Holies forgetting to do something and <laughs> ended up dead on the floor, yeah. you know, <laughs> which, which was one of the rabbi's biggest fears, yeah. you know, yeah. and, 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 there's a, a whole thing on that. So God is always an exclusive God. And uh, God is the one who determines what truth is. And God is the one who determines how you come to him, not us. And so Jesus is very clear about that. I was, you know, when I was coming to faith, man, I I, I, I couldn't stand that exclusiveness until one day I said, you know what? If there's more than one way, then which one is it? Mm-hmm. And it made so much sense to me that God was merciful and made it easy for us. And that was come to Jesus mm-hmm. and you'll find everlasting life and forgiveness. Yeah. For me, that really worked, really helped me. What, one of the things that people ask me all the time was, do Jewish people need to believe in Jesus to be saved? My answer is all people, not just Jewish people. There are a lot of people out there in this world that we all need to come to Yeshua, to the Lord Jesus. Uh, here's what what he himself said to Jewish people in John chapter 8, verse 24. If you do not believe, and my version says that I am he, but in Greek it says, if you do not believe that I am, which is identifying himself as deity, if you do not believe that I am, you will die in your sins. This is what the Messiah himself says to all of us. But in this case, in this context, uh, it's it's faith in him to a Jewish audience is what he's talking about. John eight twenty four, and so I just I think that this is why I believe in life and Messiah, and why I believe in Chosen People Ministries. I'm so grateful that there was a Hilda Kozer serving with Chosen People Ministries who wanted to tell me about the Messiah. Uh, and I've, I, I, this is crucial. It's why I've given my life personally uh, to telling Jewish people about the Messiah, not obnoxiously, not beating them over the head lovingly, just as I would with anyone else, but nevertheless pointing them to Messiah. Yeah, I will just say, not only do our Jewish friends need the Messiah, the Messiah is especially for our Jewish friends. So Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, Jew, Gentile, male, female, slave, free, everybody, to the Jew first, yeah, and also to the Gentile or the Greek. yeah, And so... If there's anybody that we should be so excited to share the gospel with, it's our Jewish friends to whom the Messiah was first promised. And as we already covered in Romans chapter 9, God used the Jewish people to pen and preserve the scriptures, the the very book that so many of us hold dear. We would not have if it weren't for faithful Jewish men and women. Mm -hmm. Romans 3, 1. What advantage has the Jew? Great in every respect, for to them we're committed the oracles of God. Oracles of God. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and, you know, I've got it. Here we are talking about this, but I, I, as long as we're mentioning Romans 3, I think, I can't, I can't not read Romans 3 in the context of supersession or replacement theology. 
Uh, because it says, what then? If some, meaning Jewish people, did not believe, will their unbelief cancel God's faithfulness? Absolutely not, verse 4 says. God must be true, even if everyone else is a liar. So that's, that's pretty clear that God's going to be faithful to his promises to Israel. But they must also, all people need to come to God the Father. So in what sense, Mitch, if, if individual salvation, personal salvation comes through faith in Jesus, in what sense are we saying that the Jewish people are still chosen, a people of God? Chosen for a destiny, a destiny that grows out of the Abrahamic covenant. So we have the promise of a people, a place, the land, and we have a promise of a vocation, a mission to the world Mm -hmm. to bring the message of the gospel. But implicit also in the Abrahamic covenant, you can see it as it unfolds uh, through Isaac and Jacob. You see that implicit is a promise of a relationship with God as a nation, as a people. And so you see that spelled out in a number of passages. In Romans 11, of course, verse 25, and all Israel will be saved. And you see it in Matthew 23, verses 37 through 39, that uh, that Jesus will not return until the Jewish people say, Baruch haba b'ashem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then in Zechariah 12.10, we see another uh, point of national salvation, where they will look unto me, the me is, of course, Jesus, whom they have pierced and mourned for him as one mourns from an only begotten son. And so the whole idea of national salvation, salvation as a people, is in Scripture. However, uh, that national salvation, in a sense, comes uh, one at a time. Peter knew that when he was preaching in Acts chapter 4, where he said, he's the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. And verse 12 is critical of Acts 4. And there is salvation in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven where uh, that has been given among men by which we must be saved. So even though there will be a national salvation to forgiveness of sin, to the spirit living within. When the whole nation Jewish believes. Heart, the, the whole nation believes. However, we must understand clearly that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved, that it is a personal one-by-one group commitment to the message of the gospel, that Jesus died for our sins, rose from the grave, and that it's only through faith in him that we can be saved. Mm -hmm. So as clear as Scripture can be about this, you know, people come up with all sorts of theories and ways that, you know, maybe a backdoor, maybe a post-death. There are all sorts of explanations, but let's just stick with the clear teaching of Scripture. If there's any other way, I'll let God deal with that. But for me, as I understand Scripture, I am going to stick with what the Bible says, which is why the Lord Jesus said, uh, make disciples of the nations. You know, I was just talking with one of our professors in intercultural studies here at Moody, and we were talking about Romans uh, chapter 10, and what he was saying is... Uh, he was thinking about using it as a verse for one of our conferences coming up as a theme verse. And what he was saying is, uh, it says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. There's no distinction between, uh, you know, he's using this passage, how will they hear uh, if unless one is sent, right? Uh, that whole thing. And uh, it says, uh on the contrary, what does it say? The message is near, it's in your mouth uh, and in your heart. This is the message of faith we proclaim, right? Uh, and how can they call on him? Verse 14 says, whom they have not believed in. He says, this is just a Jewish context, and we use this verse about all kinds of missions. And I said to him, I said, look at verses 12 and 13. There's no distinction between Jew and Greek. The image people might have is that it's only Jewish people that need to believe in Jesus. But what Paul is saying is Jewish people are just like everyone else. They also need to believe in Jesus. And yet when it says, how can they call on him, they have not believed in. Do you know what that's talking about? Jewish people. Uh, you know, we need God has called each and every one of us if we're not Jewish. Because it says, Romans 11 
Uh, God, salvation has come to the Gentiles. One of God's purposes is to make the Jewish people jealous with our message. So let, let's not miss our opportunity of the, fulfilling the Gentile Great Commission to reach Jewish people. I'm going to come back in a moment with my guests, so don't go away. You're listening to Open Line with Michael Rydelnik, coming right back. Each weekend on Open Line with me, Dr. Michael Rydelnik, we study the scriptures around our radio kitchen table. You can become a kitchen table partner through your monthly support of Open Line. Your gifts help me to provide biblical answers to questions that many believers have about the Savior, the scriptures, and the spiritual life. Along with other partners, you're helping people receive guidance from God's Word. Become a Kitchen Table Partner today. Call 888-644-7122 or go to openlineradio.org. We're so glad that FEBC partners with Open Line with Dr. Michael Rydelnik, bringing the FEBC mailbag every week. Learn how Far East Broadcasting Company is taking Christ to the world at febc.org. On their weekly podcast, Until All I've Heard with Ed Cannon, You'll hear stories of lives changed by Messiah all across the globe. Again, you can hear the podcast when you visit febc.org. That's febc.org. Welcome back to this special edition of Open Line. It's all about Israel all the time. No calls today. Just a discussion with Levi Hazen of Life and Messiah, of with Mitch Glazer, president of Chosen People Ministries, Eva Rydelnik, uh, and I, we're all discussing Israel, the Jewish people, and we've come to the part that everyone wants to read about and talk about, which is prophecy. That's what we want to talk about now, uh, if that's possible. Uh, the biggest question that people ask all the time is this modern state of Israel, what does it have to do with Bible prophecy, if anything. I thought it was uh, kind of funny. I was reading in a commentary years ago by a guy named Martin Luther, and he uh-huh. took those land promises and those land promises uh, in Genesis, and he said, if we take these literally, then it means that the Jewish people would have to come back to their land someday. And so uh, he wrote basically, that could never be. So. <laughs> So we have to take them figuratively, these promises. And uh, I would say, I think Marty got it wrong. You know, there we go. Uh, And so uh, what do you think? Uh, when When we look at the modern state of Israel, what's the significance? Is it a fulfillment of Bible prophecy? How will this come come to be? Well, I think it is. Oh, abs- well, you know what? I think yeah. uh, I think Mitch is raising his hand first, so we'll go in order. <laughs> I'm, re- yeah. I'm re- preach the gospel in and out of season. I'm yeah. ready. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Going to Ezekiel chapter 36, which for me is so powerful, and uh, uh, there, there are parts about it that bother me because I'm Jewish and it, I take it personally. But let me go ahead and uh, and read it. Ezekiel 36, verse 20. We'll start there. When they came to the nations where they went, they profaned my holy name because it was said of them, these are the people of the Lord, yet they have come out of the land. Now, we have to understand that that's the fulfillment of prophecy because God said through Moses that if Israel disobeyed, they'd be cast out of the land. And so that was. Verse 21, but I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations where they went. As the Jewish people were living in the land, which was in profaning the name of God, that's what they did outside the land in profaning the name of God. These are harsh words. I don't love them, but they are true. Verse 22, therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it's not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for my holy name. So God is jealous for his name and he's about to act. And he says, the name which you've profaned among the nations where you went. Verse 23, I will vindicate the holiness of my great name which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their profaned in their midst. So God's going to do something that's going to stun and startle the nations. And what is that thing that he's going to be? He's going to take people who were not acting as if they were uh, enjoying the fruit of the new covenant with forgiveness and the law written in their heart, but instead it's going to be quite different. So then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord, when I well, prove myself holy among you in, in their sight. 
Ready for verse 24? Here's what God's going to do. Here's what God's going to do. When uh, he shocks the nations into seeing something different. For I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. Now, that's really important. And the reason it's important is because after thousands of years, the Jewish people, and pretty much the majority of Jewish people, or at least 48% of the Jewish people, have have moved to the land of Israel, and most do not believe in God, and most do not even believe, of course, believe in Jesus. So if you ask me, did God, is prophecy fulfilled with the starting of the reinitiating of the nation of Israel in 1948? Is this a fulfilled prophecy? Is this a miracle of God? I would say, absolutely, it's a fulfilled prophecy. If the Jewish people came back to the land, were praising Jesus, singing hymns, and worshiping, I would say something, we missed a step somewhere along the line. The Jewish people would have come back in unbelief, and it was while in the land that the Spirit would fall upon the Jewish people and they would be saved. Verse 25, right? I'll sprinkle clean water in you and you will be clean, etc. So, What I think is so interesting there, Mitch, is that in Hebrew, which you and I have studied a little bit, right? It it has a conjunction there that, like the New American Standard translates, then, having brought you back to the land, then I will sprinkle clean water on you. At the beginning of 25. Yeah, at the beginning of verse 25. And my version that I'm reading right now, the HCSB, doesn't have the conjunction. It left it out. But it's so crucial because it gives the order. First, Israel comes back while not yet believing in, in Yeshua. And then verse 25, only when they're back in the land will they experience the forgiveness of God once once they New American believe Standard, 1995, mm-hmm. puts the conjunction in. <laughs> yeah, I'm really... Yeah, that's why even but, even won't use my true. Bible just for that conjunction. <laughs> it's one being, ver- this is one verse. That one verse, you won't use it. So anyway... Uh, but it is, but it is something, isn't it, Michael? It's that, amazing that that I mean, we're we're looking at fulfill a prophecy that the Jewish people have come back in unbelief. That's why I'm so I feel so honored to be part of God's plan for part two, mm-hmm. uh, because Chosen People has 30 workers in Israel, and we're sharing the gospel day in and day out through hardship, through bombs, running the bomb shelters, you name it, and a bunch of them are Moody grads. Mm-hmm. But God is blessing that work. But that work will one day lead because the seed sown will lead. The word of God will not come back void. One day God's word will be fulfilled and restoration through Jesus the Messiah will come. Mm-hmm. Amen. Yeah, uh, You want to mention something else, Levi? Well, I wanted to mention Ezekiel 37, uh, okay. the following chapter, if we're ready for that. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I love it that that Dr. Glazer brought up Ezekiel chapter 36 and all of God's wonderful promises uh, to regenerate Israel. Ezekiel 37 seems to take what's prophesied in Ezekiel 36 and say, okay, here's the process by which this is going to happen. And of course, that's the famous chapter uh, on the valley of dry bones. And so God brings Ezekiel to this valley. He's looking at all the bones and God asks him, hey, can these bones live? And he responds very wisely. He says, oh, Lord, only you know, which is a good way to respond if the Lord asks you a question. Yeah. And sure enough, uh, in this vision, Ezekiel's watching and the bones begin to, to rattle together and then they come together and stand up and, and, and it goes through these stages and sinew, skin grows on them and they're all standing up. But there's a problem if they're all standing up. They're lacking the breath, the ruach, the, the, the spirit of God is lacking. And so God tells Ezekiel, Breathe on these slain so that they may live again. And sure enough, the breath of God comes and he says, this is the whole house of Israel, son of man. That's who these people are, the whole house of Israel. And so I think what we see here in these stages with these bones, most people aren't aware that Israel has actually been regathered in stages. And largely it's happened, unfortunately, through persecution. Mm -hmm. But there's been multiple major waves of immigration starting in the early 1880s uh, where Jewish people have in mass come back to the land of Israel and they've purchased the land, they've cultivated it and so forth. They've, they've built communities and, and had to defend themselves. Now, in of the course, process. that's not to say there were no Jews in the land in 1882 when it began, but large numbers. Have that's right. Come. Mm-hmm. That's right. So there's always been a continual Jewish presence in the land of Israel, but 
these were these waves were unlike anything previous. Mm -hmm. And Ezekiel here seems to be describing in his Valley of Dry Bones vision the reality that the Jewish people are going to come back to the land in unbelief. There's going to be a nation state, and then God will say, breathe on these slain so that they may live. And that's the Spirit of God being poured out on them, uh, just as Zechariah forecasts and almost all of the Hebrew prophets talk about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, it's so crucial to see that, that uh, the the breath of God comes upon them at the end. We're going to talk about when that happens, but the key is they come in stages. We're still seeing a stage right now. There's a lot of French yes. uh, Jews coming to Israel right now. Uh, in the last 10 years, large numbers of Jews from France, and also I think we're going to see more because we're going to see more and more anti-Semitism. So anyway, we're going to take a break here. Uh, we're going to come back and talk about what the future holds a little bit more and what the current situation in Israel is right now. So don't go away. This is a special open line Israel edition with Levi Hayes and Mitch Glazer, Eva Rydelnik, and me, Mike Rydelnik. Stay right there. We're coming back with more right here on Open Line. Are you prepared for the earth-shaking events that will unfold when the Messiah Jesus returns? Do you feel confident in your knowledge of what is to come? In The King is Coming, Dr. Erwin Lutzer provides an eye-opening look at 10 future events surrounding the second coming of Jesus. Request your copy of The King is Coming when you give a gift of any amount. Call 888-644-7122 or visit openlineradio.org. Welcome back to Open Line. It's been a, a great morning as we talk about Israel, the Jewish people, past, the present, the future. My guests have been and continue to be Levi Hazen of Life and Messiah, Mitch Glazer of Chosen People Ministries, Eva Rydelnik of Moody and also of Chosen People Ministries, uh, and me, Michael Rydelnik. Here's the thing, you know, we've seen since 10-7 this brutal attack on Israel by Hamas. And then Israel's response uh, to deal with Hamas. This war has been going on for months and months, and it's a heartbreaking war in, in every respect. But I keep getting asked, how does this relate to Bible prophecy? And, you know, I can't find a specific, this is, this war is predicted in Bible prophecy. But Eva, what, what did you want to say about that? Well, I think the thing that was so shocking about the October 7th was the nation's reaction to it. At first, the first few hours, it was like all the world was going, oh, this is so horrible. I can't believe this has happened. Israel is, you know, the, the, the ter been victimized by this horrible, horrible attack. And then within the blink of an eye, all of a sudden, all the, the political – Talk has switched, and Israel is the bad guy. It just seems impossible that in such a short amount of time that opinion, world opinion, has changed to make Israel the bad guy. And not just at, university campuses, not on just university campuses, but if you look at what's happening in in the in houses of government all across Europe, and of course across the Arab world, and it makes me think of uh, Zechariah twelve two. This is talking about the end times, and the Lord says, the Lord who created the heavens and the earth, it says in, in 12.1, he says, behold, I'm going to make Jerusalem a cup that causes reeling to all the peoples around. There will be a siege on Jerusalem that all God is going to bring all the nations against Jerusalem like in Jerusalem itself is going to be like a, 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 a person staggering a staggering drunk. All of the nations are going to be gathered against Israel. Mm -hmm. And I think what's happening now is just a precursor to these final days. Yeah, it says that on that day, I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. All who try to lift it will injure themselves. So God's going to protect Israel. I was thinking too about Zechariah 14, 
I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem yeah, for and, battle. And it says two. at the end of that, that verse 3, you were just reading, all the nations of the earth will be gathered against her. And, and I think sometimes we think, well, that can't be. You know, there's the United States will protect Israel. The, the, and the UN. And the blah, UN. Blah. And no, uh, the nations will gather against Israel. And how can this kind of anti-Semitism erupt again? We've learned our lesson. And here we see it again happening now. So even though I'm not saying that this is the nation's gathering for against the, Jerusalem. For the uh, final time, uh, yeah. but there is a there is a, a turn of opinion against Israel. And and we can just so see that happening. Uh, it doesn't it's not inconceivable at all. I think it's a it's a picture of what could potentially Because it feels happen. like nineteen thirty eight all over again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh so how how does the return of Israel and these kinds of events, how does it relate to, you know, the Bible talks about and the Lord Jesus talks about the times of the Gentiles. And uh, Luke 21, he talks about the times of the Gentiles when Jerusalem was trodden down by the Gentiles. I think even now we're in that time. Uh, Jerusalem is uh, maybe in Israel's hands, but uh, there's a whole lot of nations that have their opinions about what Israel can do, and there isn't a great deal of autonomy about what Israel can do there. But it says in Luke 21, uh, until the to- until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled, which tells us there will be a time when they're fulfilled. What's going to happen when the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled? Well, good good question, Michael. <clears throat> Uh, if I can just maybe paint just a little bit of a, of a picture along with this. Uh, the times of the Gentiles, of course, means that uh, we should be reaching more Gentiles because there's a great urgency because the day's coming when night will come mm-hmm. and Gentile evangelism will be over. We're, I'm always looking for the last Gentile to be saved. If anybody listening has their email, I'd like to... <laughs> I, I, or address, I'll, I'll be on the next plane because, uh, but I think we also have to uh, wed this with other predictions in scripture like Jeremiah chapter 30, verse seven. And that's the time of Jacob's trouble, Jacob's distress, uh, but he will be saved from it, uh, uh, Jeremiah adds, which is of course wonderful. So th- as we get closer and closer to the second coming of Christ, and I'm, I believe, in a pre-trib rapture. So, Me too. You know, uh, Me so three. I believe yeah. that that's. <laughs> so I believe that's 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 part of the scenario, the end time scenario, and but without a doubt, I believe that there's going to be a seven year tribulation uh, coming up. There was a great rabbinic scholar and dear brother in the Lord, Rachmiel Friedland, who survived the Holocaust. He's a Polish Jewish guy, and I had the, the joy of spending uh, quite a bit of time with him in, in different circumstances. And once he said to a small group of us who were studying prophecy, he said, you can never talk about the tribulation period without tears. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was it was pretty powerful. And of course, it was born out of his experience. So we have to remember that there will be a specific time of seven years of Jacob's trouble, three and a half and three and a half. That will, I believe the Bible teaches that. I wish it didn't, but it does. And so we have to add all of that with Israel's uh, restoration. So the question, of course, prophetically, Michael, is whether or not we have entered into that time of Jacob's trouble. And of course, I would say we haven't. And so, unfortunately, the message there is that the worst is yet to come, not yeah. yet mm-hmm. just that the best is yet to come. Mm-hmm. And so we have to recognize that, which for me as a missionary to the Jewish people and, and, and you as having trained dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of missionaries to the Jewish people and being a good missionary to the Jews yourself, you and Eva and Levi as well, this means we really got to get up and go, you know, I mean, this is the moment. Uh, we see the sign that Israel's back in unbelief, um, and but we know what's coming. And so the restoration's coming, but first comes something yeah. else. It's the darkness before the dawn. Yeah. And so I would encourage all of us to think in terms of Jewish evangelism because we need to get started now. 
Yeah, I think it's an intensive intensifier preparing I mean. the people for that time when the, the, there's 144,000 Jewish evangelists across the tribulation period, according to Revelation seven. But here's the thing: uh, yeah. God's going to use that persecution when the nations gather. He, he's going to use that to open the hearts of Jewish people, and the leadership of Israel yes. that led the Jewish people away will make a decision to follow Jesus. And that's why Zechariah twelve ten says they will call upon the Lord Jesus. They will look upon the pierced one. They will mourn in repentance and put their trust in him. And that's what Paul is talking about in Romans eleven twenty six when he says, and then at that time, all Israel will be saved. Uh, when the deliverer comes from Zion, they will call for him. He will return. His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, according to Zechariah 14. He will make a way of escape. He'll deliver Israel. It's it's a, a tremendous future that's going to happen when Israel will finally come to believe. I just I just want to spare my unsaved family from what's to come also. Yeah. You know, there was something very interesting that happened. Somebody did a quick study. Oh, we don't have time. Wish we did. Another time, Mish, will you come back and tell us about the quick study? I hope so. It's all about it's all about the Psalms. I yeah, will. That'd be great. Well, thanks for listening, everyone. Thank you, Levi Hazen, for joining me. Mitch Glazer, Eva Rydelnik, uh, had a great time talking about Israel, the Jewish people, and even Bible prophecy, past, present, future. Check out our website, OpenLineRadio.org. It's got all the links you're looking for, including our current resource, how to become a kitchen table partner, even the chosen people resources there. Uh, We're going to come back next week. We'll talk about your questions about the Bible, God, and the spiritual life. Open Line with Dr. Michael Rydelnik is a production of Moody Radio, a ministry of Moody Bible Institute. See you next week. Have a great week.